Speedway Report is produced and broadcast by the Zeus Radio Network for Racers Reunion Radio. Well, USAC is bringing their traditional heat out west this week. Dirt late models are still going strong here in the south. And major league grids are a-changing. We've got some retirements and some quality guys out of rides. We've got all this and more coming up. Welcome to Speedway Report for Monday, November the 25th, 2019. From the shores of Lake Norman in Ray City, USA, Mooresville, North Carolina, I'm Patrick Reynolds, and thank you for joining the fastest half hour in racing. November 25th, one month until Christmas, which means we've got about 29 days before the fellows start shopping. Am I right? Guys, am I right? I think I am. Have you subscribed to our YouTube channel yet? Get Speedway Report dumped right into your mailbox each week. YouTube, subscribe. YouTube, subscribe. One more time, YouTube, subscribe. Just go look for Speedway Report with Patrick Reynolds, and we are there. The Speedway Report victory lane lap is kind of thin this week, weekend before Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving being a touch late this year as well, but we do have some racing. The USAC Midgets raced in Bakersfield, California last week. Kyle Larson of NASCAR fame was the winner on Saturday night. Sunday afternoon, closer to home here in our studios, in Gaffney, South Carolina, the Dirt Late Model stage, the Blue Gray 100, Chris Madden was your winner, well, wound up being last night. They tried to do a doubleheader with a race Saturday night in Lancaster, South Carolina, with the Palmetto State 50. Unfortunately, rained out, canceled, will not be made up, which is just a heartbreak this time of year. With the summer, we've got plenty of rain dates, uh, pushing December. Not so much with the weather, but at least we got a little bit of racing to talk about. Let's talk about some fellas that will be racing and driving something else coming up soon. We're going to begin with Sebastian Bourdais, one of the best drivers I've ever seen in American open wheel racing. He went across the pond, went to Flo for Formula One. Uh, let's call it what it was. He was a back of a park, park, back of the pack runner over there, but Formula One is so much dictated by the equipment that you have. Really tough. It's almost car versus car as opposed to driver mm -hmm. and driver. Bourdais came back to the U.S. in the early 2000s, landed in IndyCar, and has been strong. He was strong before. Uh, in the mid-2000s, went to F1, came back here, and has been running for the better part of the decade here with IndyCar in the United States. Recently, he was with Dale Coyne Racing, transformed to ownership with Vassar Sullivan Racing. For 2020, Sebastian Bourdais is out of an IndyCar ride. Now, he wasn't out of a ride for long. He will be on the grid in the IMSA series. He will be a teammate to Joao Barbosa at JDC Miller Motorsports. They'll have some other help for the endurance contest, but the two of them, Barbosa and Bourdais, they will be a threat for the championship right out of the gate. Why is Bourdais out of uh, Vassar Sullivan? It wasn't really said specifically, but much like James Hinchcliffe, money. That's always the case. It takes a whole lot of money to make these cars go. And so you come to a point a lot, uh, some of these owners do, you need a funded driver. You need a driver with some backing to come forth with the check. That doesn't mean that driver is not good. It just means he's got to check. Now, unfortunately, those type of guys are mixed in with low-talent folks that have a lot more money than cents when it comes to driving. Not always, though. So I don't automatically throw gentlemen drivers, what we call them in sports car racing, under the bus. There's a lot of good guys, good drivers, and they've pumped a lot of money into the sport. That's a good thing. We do get into ride buying. There's some guys with a lot of talent. They have money good they got the opportunity it's the guys with a ton of talent but don't have the big checkbook behind them to pave their way Bourdais is one of them he is not a pay-to-play driver he is a i am getting paid driver because he does have the talent he's a race winning championship driver indycar well not so much in f1 but we talked about that he will be in sports car racing next year definite threat for the championship I'd be surprised if he had anything but uh, at any kind of a subpar season in the IMSA series next year, Bourdais going there. We remember his brutal crash uh, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway a few years ago between qualifying and the race and got a sub for the 500. 
what a remarkable job he did with physical fitness and training and rehab and came back. Bourdais uh, went back into the uh, Vassar Sullivan ride, did an outstanding job. I think he got a whole lot more out of Dale Coyne's equipment than anybody else has. He, he can f- out drive in far superior in lesser equipment with that. Put him in a good sports car ride, which he is in JDC. I'd be surprised if uh, Bordet doesn't vict- visit victory lane on multiple occasions next season. No word on Hinch either. James Hinchcliffe is another guy that was displaced well, with the McLaren full-time gig coming here to IndyCar, uh, basically boosting him out of a ride just because of the money situation. Now, Bordet and Hinch, from IndyCar's point of view, those are two name marquee guys I would want to keep on the grid. Bordet lost his ride with Vassar Sullivan's uh, entry, but within a matter of hours or days at least, he was signed on for a full season of IMSA racing. It has been several weeks since Hinch found he got his walking papers out of the McLaren gig, and I've yet to hear as we record this show, November 25th, what Hinch will be doing next year. I've seen some uh, pictures on social media with him on uh, with some clear water, blue skies, sandy beaches. So please, weighing out his options, I really, really want this guy back on the grid. He's that name personality type of guy that IndyCar needs. Race winning, positive, threat for victories, and to run up front. But he's got that definitely got the personality and the social media savvy, which IndyCar needs. Uh, Bourdais and Hinch would be a shame for IndyCar to lose either one of them. They'd be very talented folks. They put people in the grandstands. Fans watch on TV. They've got a fan base. They should both be back in IndyCar, but we won't see either one of them. So far, I don't have anything to report to you guys for 2020 of either guy other than Bourdais being a full-time in IMSA. Now, one more lap around in the world of NASCAR. He will be not a full-time cup driver in 2021, but he will retire at the end of 2020. Uh, Jimmy Johnson, going by the wayside. He has wins. He's got championships. And it is time. He is in his early 40s. Uh, last several years, he hasn't won, which was you would think would be astonishing early on in his career as he won in his rookie season and then just kept winning for... I could have looked up the number for how many seasons straight. Uh, he's got seven championships, all under some sort of a chase playoff format. But I've said over and over again as many times as I beat up the chase and the playoffs on the show, how I cannot stand them. I've never taken Jimmy Johnson to task as a race car driver by the number of race wins that he has. He's won a ton of races, one of the best drivers that this sport has ever seen. I just cannot stand playoff-style championships. Now, he does not get the respect he deserves, admittedly even from me, because of his seven championships when you compare them to Richard Petty and Dale Earnhardt. I don't put him in the same league, his championships in the same leagues as those guys, but that could be skewed either way. Without the playoff-style format, how many championships would Johnson have? There's really no way of telling. There is not a direct crossover uh, from the Latford system to the playoff system because people race differently in playoffs versus a straight 36 race season. So you cannot just do the math and say, well, this would have happened. That's not how it works. Jeff Gordon would not have all these championships. Jimmy Johnson would not have all these championships. Dale Earnhardt Jr., however, Tony Stewart, doesn't matter. Go on and on, doesn't matter. Uh, Guys race differently under a playoff format. So decisions are made all the time differently. It's not an apples-to-apples comparison. However, with the amount of race wins that he has, I think Johnson is actually the most, is the winning this active driver. And someone like him who is who has been the championship winner and then follow that up with several winless seasons, although competitive at times, he is certainly, for whatever reason, car, driver, crew chief, what you know, he was with Chad Knauss for so many years. He's a, a step possibly too slower than what he used to be. You don't want to wallow out your career and just slowly, slowly, quietly dissipate to the back of the pack. One of the greats we just talked about, Richard Petty did it. Another one, Daryl Waltrip did it. These guys are two of the best that NASCAR has ever seen, but the last several years of their careers were sad to watch. Jimmy Johnson's is not that level. I don't want him to be sad to watch either. I'd like to, to retire with some dignity. I can't stand playoffs. I can't stand chases. 
I do like Jimmy Johnson as a race car driver. He doesn't decide what playoff format or what format he decides a championship in. I don't like the playoffs formats. I don't like that style. I don't like those championships. However, Johnson does not get to decide that. He just rolled out there and raced as hard as he could under the system that was in place. So big hat tip to Jimmy Johnson. Admittedly, one of the best I have ever seen in this sport, but I just don't put his seven titles alongside Earnhardt's or Petty's. But I'm glad that he isn't just stepping away, that we do get a chance to see him go around one more time, take another lap around the NASCAR Cup garage, the NASCAR Cup tour, and we get to uh, say goodbye to him a year from now in Phoenix and watch him run all these races one final time. We talked about the uh, victory lane lap shortly ago, and there wasn't a whole lot going on, but there is a busy, busy Thanksgiving weekend of racing coming up. I'm kind of pumped for it. I'm glad that it's a big holiday full of racing, much like Memorial Day and 4th of July. Thanksgiving's getting pretty big there. But as typical, uh, some of the Twitter accounts and social media accounts run by the big NASCAR tracks don't understand the difference between the cup season and racing. You said, well, racing season is over. No, it is not over, not by a long shot. Uh, I tweeted back to whoever runs this, the Twitter account at Chicago Speedway. They said, racing season is over. What are you doing? And people were saying, well, well, football, well, my kids, well, this, well, that. I said, racing season isn't over. We just had the Blue Gray 100 yesterday afternoon. This coming weekend, we've got Formula One still for their final race in Abu Dhabi. The Turkey Derby is coming up at Wall Stadium in New Jersey. The Thanksgiving Classic at Kenley, North Carolina. Turkey Night Grand Prix out in Ventura, California. A USAC historical race each and every year. One of the biggest events on USAC schedule. Arguably the biggest event on their schedule. I don't know. Uh, USAC four crown, the four crown nationals at Eldora come to mind. Maybe some of the mild dirts with the, with the silver crown cars. Uh, the gobbler is being run in Accord, New York, the leftover this weekend at 411 speedway in Tennessee in, uh, about uh, the following, is it follow yeah, the following week is the snowball derby. You get into early January. We've got the Tulsa shootout and the chili bowl in Oklahoma, to that, I see Chicago Speedway racing season over. I don't think it ever is on our Speedway Report victory lane laps. I've been proud to say we've gone years and years with some kind of results to talk about each and every week. The only thing I really missed, uh, I guess, when the weekend came, and it was Christmas weekend. Yeah, nobody really held a race Christmas, literally, uh, but we've gotten close to it a few times. Um the big indoor show in Fort Wayne, the Rumble in Fort Wayne, is right after Christmas. Uh, New Smyrna got the Red Eye 100. Lots of good stuff. I I don't think we're going to have a problem. I don't believe there is an off season anymore in the world of racing, which has its pros and it has its cons. Let's digest um, NASCAR's finale a couple of weeks ago, the Cup Series finale anyway, at Homestead, Miami, Florida. Want to talk about that for a bit? There, the t looked at the TV ratings for this thing. Uh, with a two, it averaged a two point two rating, three point seven million viewers on NBC. Which, what does that translate to? The lowest rating in the twenty year history of the race, and the smallest audience since at least two thousand. I got some more to talk about, but let's hold it right there. Let's hold up. I'll say that again. Lowest rating in the 20-year history of the race and the smallest audience since at least 2001. Little history lesson for everybody. Pre-2001, tracks negotiated their own television broadcast deals as opposed to NASCAR taking them over in 2001 as series deals. So when we looked at uh, the finales, the championship race, whether it was in Riverside, California, or Atlanta, Georgia for so many years, that those tracks negotiated with a network what kind of coverage that they had. So I think they're w looking at this just from the current television package. There have been several contracts signed, but this package is new as of 2001 and later. Now, I've said for years in NASCAR's defense, ratings have gone down. People have said, well, we got to figure out how to get them up. I said that's a losing battle. Ratings will continue to plummet. That is not a NASCAR thing. That's a technology and current times thing is that people consume data 
sports information news far differently than we did in 2001 and certainly before that. There were, there were times when the only way to see the Rays was to, you better be in front of your TV when the race happened. Much like Charlie Brown's Christmas, Saturday morning cartoons, call it what you want. If you weren't, when I was a kid, if you weren't in front of the TV when the event happened, you missed it, period. That was the end of it. Now we watch things on our phone. There's 10-minute recaps of ball games, 30-minute versions of a ball game. Auto racing does the same thing. Not everybody watches a sport live, but they catch the uh, abbreviated version of it later. They can follow it on social media. There's times I don't watch races, but follow them lap by lap on a Twitter account or an Instagram account, and I'm updated constantly. Don't need to watch the race. The television ratings, uh, how they're they're uh, totaled up, don't affect that digital consumption of the race. So I know the ratings for Homestead Miami are extremely low, However, I think the race fan consumes it differently. I don't think this is different from any other sport out there. Super Bowl, World Series, Stanley Cup, pick your poison. I think all the ratings are low because just as a society, we consume information differently. And the ratings technology has not caught up with people watching things on their phones or tablets or devices abbreviated after the fact. We have a live audience here on Speedway Report. Majority of my audience watches these, these shows in a podcast in the week following the live broadcast. We do this every Monday uh, you know, live on Facebook. Then it gets spread over, uh, over social media and expanded. A large percentage of this audience watches the show within the next week and not live. Live sports, TVs, and movies, are there's no different. They're consumed. That's one theory on the Miami Homestead low ratings. The other is it could be like me where this playoff artificial four-way tie sucks that bad and we're not going to watch it because I don't care. That's kind of how I lean is I don't really f- – wasn't going to watch it anyway. You know, I long for the days of the Latford system when we went to Atlanta in November and we just raced. There was no artificial tie. I am of that nature. There's plenty of people, as I read today, proponents and supporters of the playoff system. Cool, man. Good for you. This show and me, this host, are not. I am one of your missing ratings points. I don't turn on the TV. I'm a missing seat in the media center. I'm not there at the racetrack writing about it because I don't care, and I'm certainly not a fan in the grandstands spending money to buy a ticket to go see the event, again, because as a fan, I don't care. I prefer other forms of racing that don't have this circus playoff atmosphere in place. I'm one guy. I vote with my wallet. Uh, Of the 32 cup races that were run as scheduled this season, uh Homestead was the 18th to post a decline in ratings uh, and the 19th to hit an all-time or a decade-plus low. Uh, the spring Kansas race did not decline, but still tied a ratings blow. In other words, television ratings across the board for NASCAR Cup Series are very small compared to what they used to be years ago. Everything's declined over years. I, you know, I'm looking at a 2.2 rating, 3.74 million viewers. I remember when we were consistently fives, when the Cup Series was was largely, uh, you know, a five rating, six or seven million viewers. Daytona 500 was upwards of 20 to 30 million viewers. Uh, relative terms, a Super Bowl is around 100 million viewers. So I think there's a combination here of old school fans that are no longer watching. That's clear by the empty seats and also how we are uh, digesting or consuming digital content. Uh, all the ratings are just down across the board. Now, why is this? We talked about why, a couple of different reasons. Is this purposeful? Yes. Why is this purposeful? Does that raise an eyebrow on any? Scuttlebutt, I've thought about it myself and talking to other guys. I'm not crazy, and other people have thought about it too, is that NASCAR is for sale behind the scenes. There have been rumors of other companies wanting to buy, including big stuff uh, like Fox and Disney interested in that when this new tv contract or the current tv contract i would say is up 
there will be a new contract be put in place. I think it will will go ahead. There will be a new broadcast contract. You're not going to not see the NASCAR races on TV. However, it's going to be pennies on the dollar compared to what all the networks are paying Dow. Why? Because of the ratings. You got to have the eyeballs on the sponsorship to sell the commercials to make the money to pay for the billion dollars of TV contracts. They don't have that right now. If you reduce the value of NASCAR, you can ask a better price and actually sell it. In the peak of it, in the early to mid-2000s, the price of it would have, I don't know if it was for sale, but the price of it would have been so far beyond what anybody could have afforded because it was that new darling. It was the new girl at the prom with the dress that everybody wanted a piece of. It all went away because we killed the golden goose. Now, if you lower the value of NASCAR, you can sell it because the price is now within reach of several other businesses. Think about it. Indianapolis Motor Speedway and the IndyCar Series were sold to Roger Penske. In the coming years, I would not be surprised to have a similar announcement that NASCAR now has new ownership and the France family and board of directors are no longer running the show. If you lower the value of NASCAR, i.e. less fans, less ratings with a junk playoff system and phony championship systems, yes, now the asking price for NASCAR is well within reach and you can unload it. I wouldn't be surprised if the France family is making moves behind the scenes much like the Holman family did in Indiana. Take that one to the bank. Our... Salute to Dave Despain with our Racer of the Week. I'm going to call him what it is, a guy that put a uh, car in victory lane over the weekend, regularly handles, well, well 3,400 pound stock cars and narrow tires. He went back to his roots, got on the dirt, uh, no wings, open cage. Kyle Larson is the Speedway Report Racer of the Week. I was always a fan of guys that can just about drive anything. Very few of them do it anymore. Kyle Larson is a current version of that. Tony Stewart was the one before him. Before that, you talk about the A.J. Foyts and the Mario Andretti's of the world where they just needed a steering wheel and a gas pedal, and they made it go. Kyle Larson is the Speedway Report Racer of the Week. In between our broadcasts, keep up on the world. The racing with SpeedwayReport.com. We've got some interesting article, articles to read lately. Uh, Rhonda Beck has been following the short tracks and has been sharing her insight. We've also got archived podcasts here if you want to check something out. Hook up with me on Facebook. I'm at Speedway Report with Patrick Reynolds or at Racers Reunion. Connect with me on Twitter at Speedway Report or at Speedway Pat. And you can also cast our broadcasts or podcasts here on the forum of RacersReunion.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our LinkedIn channel. Big thanks to everyone on the Facebook live feed for joining the conversation on the show tonight. I want to thank all of the military past and present for the freedoms we enjoy as Americans in our daily life, including the simple things like bench racing right here on a Monday night. Freedom is not free, and a veteran paid that bill for us. To all of the men and women who are defending freedom and watching Speedwear Report, take care of yourselves and come home soon. A special salute to the teachers, school staff, firefighters, police officers, and paramedics in our own communities. They are quiet and modest heroes every single day. God bless and thank you. You have been watching Speedway Report from the shores of Lake Norman in Race City, USA, Mooresville, North Carolina. Please like our Facebook page, Speedway Report with Patrick Reynolds, and follow me on Twitter at Speedway Pat. Now, if you are on Facebook, Right now, head on over to the Drag Racing List page. Uh, Bill, John, and Barb will take care of you at the top of the hour with Drag List Live. We'll be back here on, uh, live on Facebook next week, December 2nd, with a look at, oh, I lined, it, lined you up before. Here we go. The Turkey Derby from New Jersey, the Gobbler from New York, Formula One for Abu Dhabi, the Turkey Night Grand Prix for USAC Midgets, the Leftover in Tennessee, and the Thanksgiving Classic here in North Carolina. Thank you for watching. Have a happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I will see you all next week.